One of the most fascinating forms of freestyle art, seen mostly during Thai Pongal, which was celebrated last week, is Kola. Colorful designs decorating front yards and entrances of homes to welcome the goddess of prosperity, Lakshmi. Now, one can't have partners who are better than this. A big thank you to Skills for Inclusive Growth and Australian Aid, Selling Co Life, CDB, The Morning Newspaper, Park Street Gourmet and Zip Zip. Don't forget, if you like our show, subscribe and follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram and LinkedIn. You can now start a CDB iDeposit Digital Fixed Deposit and experience a range of special benefits from CDB. So taking a look at the week that was on CDB Snapshot, Sri Lanka saves over 1.2 billion US dollars in foreign exchange in the first three months of import restrictions. Worker remittances peaked to its highest in December with an inflow of 475.6 million US dollars, although ending 2022 at a 12-year low. Fitch ratings downgrades the national insurance financial strength of seven Sri Lankan insurers. 2022 records the highest number of elephant deaths in Sri Lanka, 433 in total. New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern is to step down. It's minus 50 degrees Celsius right now in the world's coldest city, Yaksuk, in East Siberia. on your goals. We will take care of the risks. Silly go life. This is Selinko Life News Capsule. Colombo's stock market has been on a losing streak since this year began. The boss closed last week on a negative note, nothing new, as investor sentiment weakened over possible delays in debt restructuring talks and a downgrade of Lanka's bank's ratings. Joining me in the studio today is Chairman of the Colombo Stock Exchange, Dilshan Virasekara. Dilshan, welcome. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about domestic debt restructuring, and uh, but it's been a long time coming. If it does happen, what would happen to the Colombo boss? Domestic debt restructure is still unknown. We don't know whether we will go in for it or not. There have been uh, two schools of thought. Um, and I think the government would try to avoid it at best, uh, primarily because the impact it would have on the financial market. If they take deep haircuts on those holdings, that could affect their uh, solvency, capital adequacy, and that would cause another problem for the government to recapitalize this institution. So I believe that the probability is lower that we wouldn't have. However, uh, if you look at current market, I think it's priced in. So if you take fixed income securities, the government securities market, you have the policy rate at a 14 and a half and a 15 and a half, the SDF and SLF. However, three months treasury bill is trading at over 30%. So that means that a haircut is priced in. Why we have yields at 30% is because people have priced in that risk. If it doesn't happen, it could probably be a bonus from a fixed income perspective that then yields may come down. From an equity perspective, and that was your question, um, I think it's an alternative asset class. So if people are uh, concerned about domestic debt restructure and possible haircuts to the government securities, then what an informed investor probably would do is to shift the asset class. Uh, that people may actually shift that asset class even though it's priced in and therefore I don't see a big impact to uh, the boss. And continuing that story, let's see how our stock market fared this week. The old share price index moved up by 2%, while the average daily turnover was at an unimpressive 1.5 billion rupees. WTI oil prices hovered around the 78 to 79 US dollars per barrel as US recession fears took over. Gold prices inched higher and settled above 1,900 US dollars per ounce with expectations of lower hikes in US interest rates. 
Over 300,000 migrants left Sri Lanka's shores in December 2022, a record number in recent times. This doesn't all go well for Sri Lanka, yet struggling to find its feet in a mire of issues that are yet to be resolved. On the Pethiagoda pages today, Rohan Pethiagoda opines on what this migration actually means for Sri Lanka. Rohan, there are two schools of thought about migration, especially economic. One, that while we get foreign exchange, it also exposes unskilled workers to a more sort of structured, skilled environment. And two, on the other side of the coin, that by sending our young and able, we lose our most productive citizens. What's your take? I think these two schools are largely an illusion. The inflow of earnings and the outflow of talent aren't mutually exclusive. They're, they're the same thing. We're not sending these people out. We need to remember that they're going because the grass is greener on the other side. The other thing we need to remember is that all migration is economic. No one migrates for sentimental reasons. So it's not that we're sending our young and able people out. We're sending our motivated people out, the people who want to make a better life. And we need to remember that unskilled workers, mainly from the Middle East, send back five to seven billion dollars to Sri Lanka every year, which is really good for our balance of payments. So what happens when professionals migrate? What are the economic consequences? I think the difference is that white collar workers migrate differently. They are unlikely to return because usually they migrate to Western countries that provide citizenship and they usually take their families out. And so they take their nest egg with them. They sell their assets in Sri Lanka and they take the money out usually through the black market to start a new life. But if you want to see what happens after the brains have drained, just go to Jaffna. I know it's sad to say, but 13 years after the war has ended, Jaffna is still a slum city. There's no optimism, no pride, no hope, no energy. The state that seems to manage this quite well in India is Kerala. Out of their population of 35 million, 15% are expat workers working in the Middle East, working in the West. And they make up for the brain drain by having an inflow of brains, net domestic immigration from other parts of India. So maybe it's time that Sri Lanka put aside its xenophobia and enrich the gene pool by allowing immigration into Sri Lanka. It's raining iguanas. The weather in Florida has reached levels that cause iguanas to freeze and fall from trees. When temperatures drop below 45 degrees Fahrenheit, iguanas go into a cold, stunned state. They are still alive, it's just that they can't move. Up next is S4IG Let's Talk and today we are talking big cats with Nat Geo filmmaker Dr. Alexander Brakskowski. A huge battle ensues on the accuracy of the numbers of the big cats. In steps one of the world's most premier scientists, conservation scientists, Dr. Alexander Bratskowski, who is also a National Geographic explorer and filmmaker, and he was in Sri Lanka recently collaborating with the Environmental Foundation Limited, working on a study to do just that, count cats. His 15 years of experience spans three continents, researching lion, leopard and jaguar. So welcome, Alex. You know, big cats are elusive and we grapple with numbers, but accuracy is in question. Why count cats? Why is it so important? I guess there's two key reasons. The first thing is they are amongst our most prized resources anywhere in the world. You know, there's thousands, if not millions of lives that rely on the revenue that they generate. Um, they are literally the walking cash cows of the jungle. So that's, I think, an incredibly important uh, reason, you know, they, that we need to keep track of the animals that are important for our national parks and the people that rely on them. And the second reason, uh, I think, a lot of the time we forget about in the conservation landscapes, we have a lot of NGOs, independent scientists, governments working on these species, but I think the key thing that we often forget about is accountability. So how are the conservation actions that are targeted at these species, whether it's protecting their habitat, um, doing some kind of community revenue sharing scheme, compensation for farmers, how are those things affecting the cat numbers on the, on the ground? And most importantly, the accountability also to the people that are funding conservation. 
So in your studies in Uganda and Sri Lanka, what are the similarities and the dissimilarities that you have found? I think in, in a Sri Lankan context, the, the good news that um, Dinal Samarasinghe and the, the broader scientist team that has been working in places like Wilpatu is that there's actually still quite a lot of cats on the ground. So the research that's been done up in the northwest of Sri Lanka shows that um, there's actually a lot of leopards left. Actually one of the highest densities on planet Earth, 18 individuals per 100 square kilometers. That's one of the highest um, natural occurring densities of leopards anywhere on Earth. So what it's showing you is that there's still a lot of food for them and obviously most importantly there's still a lot of leopards in that landscape. So it's actually good news because um, you know, there's something to look forward to. There's, there's still something to save, there's still something to conserve. I think in a lot of other places in, in, in the African landscapes where I've worked, it's all focused on recovery. So the cats have taken a big hit, uh, either through poaching, either through uh, you know, wire snares, um, and their densities are actually quite low. So I'd say those are the sort of two dissimilarities um, that are quite different from what you find in a lot of places in Sri Lanka and also in a lot of places across Uganda, across um, you know, Tanzania, across uh, Southern Africa. So you have collaborated with EFL in the past and currently on a research study. Uh, very briefly, what have been your findings? I've been mentoring one of their scientists, uh, Dinal Samarasinghe, also helping with fundraising. And I think one of the most important findings that he has um, generated through his big survey in Wilpatu is that um, there is still a good abundance of leopards in that area. Um, still a very good density of leopards, which is indicative not only of a healthy population of carnivores, but also a prey population that is in a good state. Um, and the most important thing is, is that is uh, Sri Lanka's largest and oldest protected area system. So it'll be good now to expand into places like Yala and other parts of the island. So in all your work with the big cats, what has been most rewarding for you? just spending time with them. You know, I've, I've had the privilege of making a few films for National Geographic and um, there's nothing quite as satisfying as being behind a camera, whether it's with a stills camera or a video camera and documenting a lot of their behaviors. Um, whether it's them climbing trees, them walking on a beach. Um, I think it's, it's filming the behavioral aspects of them that's really the most rewarding part of my work. That was Dr. Alexander Brakskowski, who is a National Geographic researcher, explorer and filmmaker, as well as a conservation scientist who joined us on Kaleidoscope today on the subject of why count cats. Immerse yourself in gourmet luxury. Park Street Gourmet is your single stop for gastronomic indulgence. Visit us any day of the week for some decadent shopping. So that was a glimpse of Gadi, Children of the Sun, by award-winning director Prasanna Vithanage showing in cinemas from today. It's a story about a woman stripped from nobility and forced to marry an outcast by the monarchy. Producer Sandhya Salgado is on Park Street Gome Life in 60 on why this resonates even today. This story is placed in uh, uh, 1814 before, before, we were, uh, before we came under the British rule. Uh, and people would think, well, it's historical and it's uh, old hat. But it talks about identity politics. On the surface of the film, it's like a love story. But there are layers and layers of uh, socio-political issues that we really uh, experience now. And um, I think uh, if you really look at it from, uh, from a broader perspective, uh, you, you would understand that it, it is uh, relevant to all times, uh, then as well as now. It's Friday and it's time for some R&R. See you next week.